Welcome back troglodytes to your daily dose of guitar information, the Troglies Guitar Show. Today we are going to guitar hunt at a dealer's website, Norman's Rare Guitars. The reason I thought this would be fun is there's a common stigmatism against purchasing a guitar from a guitar dealer, that you cannot get a good deal at a dealer, and that's not necessarily true, and I just thought it'd be fun to check out Norm's inventory. Feel free to check out their YouTube channel if you want to see some of these things in action, but let's go ahead and hunt their vintage guitars. So starting off here, the first thing that catches my eye is this L5S Custom. I'll admit, I actually looked at this one before a couple of days ago, and I offered them $4,000, which I thought was a more than fair offer for one of these things, and they never responded. And now that I see that they have this 10% off sale, it's like a $500 haggle. But the reason why I wanted one of these is because these are relatively rare guitars that nearly nobody wants. It's a solid body L5. But what makes this one extra special is it has a beautifully flamed top. But notice, it has a two-piece center seam. That's actually really rare on one of these. Typically, there'll be these ugly three-piece tops that most people don't like on these guys. And so these two-piece top ones that sell for a premium. Now, asking prices are always all over the place on these things. Some guys ask 10 grand for really nice natural ones. A lot of people ask like seven. The only thing that I found that was wrong with this one is the original seal fast tuners have been replaced. Not a big deal. Those things are really cool, but I'd be willing to let those go to get a good discount on this one. I was a little bit shocked I didn't at least get a counter offer on this one. Moving on here, it looks like a Gibson Tal Farlow. I don't know a lot about these things, but I like their cutaway. It's kind of mandolin in style, and <laughs> that's interesting. This guitar is just all upside down. So the neck pickup is backwards from what you're traditionally used to seeing. And then if you look at the inlays, those are J200 inlays, but flopped upside down. And then moving on to the headstock. They got the regular crown and also the reverse of that. I think I remember Norm talking about this one in one of their unboxing episodes recently. I don't watch all their uploads, but sometimes I'll watch those because it's cool to see what he gets at guitar shows. I don't do guitar shows a lot because I hate to travel. That's why I'm not going to NAMM. I was too apprehensive about it. Couldn't get enough information to make me feel comfortable going. But hey, maybe next year I'll go to the winter NAMM. Here's a nice SG. I would love to get a 60s or very, very early 70s SG. The late 60s ones, not quite as expensive as your early 60s, but they still have a pretty cool vibe to them. What's going on with the headstock here? <laughs> That's kind of cool. A butterfly sticker. It looked like something else was on there at one point in time. This seems to be a nice example. You've got the volute, so that definitely tells you you're within the 70s here. That's just an ACDC vibe right there. Mazrite Ventures model. These things are interesting. So the whole body is like offset a little bit. I've never noticed that before. <laughs> but the whole signature thing about this guy is that slanted neck P90 or whatever it is. I definitely know absolutely nothing about this brand except for they're kind of cool looking. And you've got a zero fret there and a bolt on neck and only $3,000. Looks like we got a couple of cool Firebirds, a 64 Firebird 1, but you could also get a cheaper Firebird 3. Now here's something I know a little bit about. The SG2. I do not like these guitars that much. Some people really dig them. They're all maple guitars, so you've got the maple neck with the maple body, but you get the rosewood fretboard. But it's kind of like the continuation of the Melody Maker series within the 70s. So there's the SG1, SG2, and then before that, I believe it was called the SG100, and there was a 200, a 250. I believe I've reviewed the SG200. They're kind of quirky guitars. The only thing that I don't like about them is the way that the neck sets into the body. It's like clunkier than usual. From these photos though, that one seems really clean. Most of these are beat up. It looks like we've got a large ding right here and a few small ones right here, but great wood grain paired with a nice bright cherry finish. I mean, something like this on reverb, I would see it selling around a thousand bucks because usually these will be between that seven to eleven hundred. So buying from a big name retailer at a price like that, eh, that's not a bad price. The only thing I don't like about these listings is there's very little information. This is a shop that just lists them on reverb because that's who's running their website right here. But they expect you to call in and talk to them, which is a good business model for the types of people that usually buy these guitars. But I'm not a big guy that likes to talk on the phone. I'm pretty busy. 
So it's nothing personal to anybody who wants to talk to me on the phone. It's just, I don't have time for that. I hardly have time enough to get these videos out. Ooh, Andy's got an SG3 Melody Maker. Oh, this is a nice one. I love the ones that have the Gibson on the pick guard right there. These late 60s SG Melody Makers are some of my favorite ones because you could get them at a budget price. I mean, they're nothing too crazily expensive, but you can find ones that have one pickup, two pickups, and three pickups. And people usually modify the heck out of these things with like P90s to make them into juniors. But I dig the Melody Maker headstock on these guys. It's just kind of an interesting vibe. And you usually get a Vibrola tailpiece on these. But at $3,000, that's a hard pass for me. I start to think about buying these things around that $1,500 price mark. But I'm sure there's a market for something as clean as this. Oh, International Series. So, I don't know a lot about this, but I remember reading that there's like a special limited colors edition that was called the International Series. I was just looking at this in the vintage price guide. Because I had to look this up when I was doing that consignment strat, which is still available if you want to make him an offer. He's willing to listen to stuff, but we don't have a lot of room on the price there. All right, so here we go. So within this guide, it says they existed in 1980 and 1981. And wow, that does look like they get quite a premium here. For the 1980 version, it looks like they get about a $300 premium. But if you jump down to 1981, something must have happened that year that I'm not familiar with. Those international colors ones that get a $500 premium. That's pretty cool. I'll have to look more into these. It kind of looks like a, a transparent mocha finish. It almost reminds me of taffy. Like you unwrap that white wrapper, which is the pick guard in this case, and then you've got that chocolate smooth taffy that you're eating. Wow, <laughs> I kind of like this one now. I wasn't really digging it at first, except for the limited edition nature of it. Nice. You either love Antigua or you hate it. I just love it, especially on a Telecaster. You don't see too many Tigua tellies out there. I've actually got a friend, Mr. Gold, looking for one of these in really clean condition. So, hey, man, I know you're watching this. Maybe this one works for you. That seems pretty clean and relatively reasonable compared to the other one we are looking at. <laughs> well, maybe not. See, this is the other one who we were looking at. This thing was listed two years ago at 4,300 bucks, but dang, this thing is mint. That's the bad thing about the Antigua finish is it kind of ages a weird yellowish hue, which doesn't necessarily jive with the original color design. But when you can get them as clean as that, they're just beautiful. So this one's aged a little bit. So if I had to choose between the two, I would definitely be going with this one. I don't see these selling anytime soon. I just noticed something. Norm's Rare Guitars takes a very similar approach to what I do. They list everything as good, even though some of the stuff looks like really clean. It could just be that the photos make it look better than it is. Let's take a quick look at this deluxe. It looks like we've got the goof hider rings. I kind of like them. It looks a little bit doofy on this particular example. I like them better on the P90 guitars because then it just looks like really fat P90s. So this is a early 70s deluxe. Seems to be in pretty clean shape. Bent tuners, that's pretty common. Never let a bent tuner scare you. These Cluson tuners will just break on you anyways. <laughs> that's another one that's priced way higher than I could ever see, but a lot of people, they go to Norm's Guitars to buy a guitar and to pay top, top dollar for it, just to say they got it from Norm's Rare Guitars. Hmm. ES-175 Thin Line? I've got to see a picture of that. <laughs> I didn't even know that existed. Cool. I'm glad I made this video now. I never knew they'd made a thin line version of the 175, but then again, I'm not really into these types of guitars, the jazz boxes, but I think they're really cool. That one seems to be in pretty clean shape as well. What is that? Guild S60. It reminds me of like a knight's helmet, how it comes down and then it has like the mouthpiece on it. It's like if you were viewing that from straight on. It's quirky. I like it. Set neck as well. Whoa. The prices on customs, the asking prices on customs have been getting crazy just all market wide. I'm not sure if people are paying that. It's possible I'm just falling behind the times because I don't buy them as much anymore. 
but people like their white customs. These things sell for a premium, and this one's definitely looking mighty clean. Well, except for that patch of rash right there. See, this is something that would sell on reverb, like at most of 3,500. Even that, I think somebody would be sitting on that for a while, because that's got the maple neck. It's not quite as desirable. I like their Super 400 CES. Those things are kind of cool when they have the uh, staple pickups in them. And here's a good example of condition is everything. Because this one right here, it's got a little bit of arm wear right here and a little bit of picking wear like the antique was usually do. And it's over $1,000 cheaper. Now this one's definitely a lot more aged looking. Now it looks like it's the end of the vintage stuff. So let's take a quick look at the used, which I think just might be more of the same, but we might find some other stuff too. This is still really tempting to me, but even paying $4,000, I think it would still be tough to get out of because I don't see it selling for any more than 5,000. But if you are in the market for this guitar, definitely buy this thing. That's a very fair price. I think it's the fairest price thing that I've seen so far. That traditional's not too bad either. Let's see, what other good deals do they got? R7 gold tops, top of the market value for a regular person's about 2,800. Oh, he's got one of these Jag strats too. I think when I sell mine, uh, it'll be around 1400 So if you're looking for one of these, mine's cheaper. <laughs> I can't wait to do this review though, because it's, it's, it's kind of a freaky guitar. But I'm guessing we're going to get quite a few different tonal things out of it. Ooh, SG Deluxe. So the thing with these guys is you've got to be very careful buying them. Because when they were brand new, these things broke all the time. And they would get auctioned off on eBay for like parts or repair. And yeah, it just kind of always scared me away from buying these. And look at this. It's a monstrosity because, well, first off, your truss rod cover is slightly crooked. It looks like even the lettering is crooked. <laughs> but it's got the custom emblem, but it's labeled as a deluxe. That makes no sense to me. Poor choice, Gibson. I think that's why we're under new management here. But they're kind of interesting at the same time with the split diamond inlays. You got three humbuckers, stock Bigsby. I think they also made these in like a green color too. Looks like they're having a sale on the new American Ultra Stratocasters if you're looking for something. Wow, you can even get an Epiphone at Norm's. That carbon's kind of interesting. I don't know anything about this brand. It's kind of from the 80s Super Strat era, I would assume. That's a really pointy headstock. Gibson had something very similar to that, but it was wider, more like a, a cleaver or something. Oh, cool. <laughs> I just purchased this guitar. It's right here. Let, let's see what he's got going on here. Les Paul limited edition. So I actually recorded this video today. So we'll be seeing that tomorrow or the day after. So this was a limited edition of 200. It's listed as number 89. But the difference is, is this one is what? That serial number's all worn off. That's crazy. Is it a three? Because if it's a three, it would be the same year as mine. It looks like we have one replaced tuner right here. Or maybe it's just reflecting the light weird. But I've yet to find one as beautiful as this one. Because there's another one from 94 on Reverb that's going to be a lot cheaper than this one. But this thing is such a beautiful guitar. Great condition. You're going to learn all about this one very soon. I found something very interesting about this guitar that I think you guys are going to like in those pickup cavities. But I like this one better because it has the Custom Shop Edition decal stamp on it because that's just super special to me. This one doesn't look like it has that ribbon mahogany top to it. But at 3145 yeah, that's going to be cheaper than mine. I actually have a waiting list of people for that guitar as soon as it's reviewed. So it'll probably sell fast. I'm honestly going to price it a little bit higher than this, I think, for my asking price. Because mine's just a little bit more special, I think. A white Supreme. At least it's one of the translucent white ones. <laughs> there are pure white Supremes that don't make much sense to me because the whole point of a Supreme is you have the super flame top and back. These are chambered out guitars. One of these days I'll get a review of these in. Supremes are strange because they fall in a weird place. They're like one of the highest end USA made guitars. I had some people confused about that in my last video. So there's Gibson USA, which is production level. And then there's Gibson Custom Shop, which is custom shop level. They're both made in USA, but USA is just the branding for production line guitars. 
So it's a production line guitar that's since been discontinued, but they start to cross over into custom shop pricing. So it just depends if it's worth it for you or not. Personally, I, I don't see it unless it's an early one or has a really cool flame top or a cool color. I would only be willing to pay about 1800 bucks for a Supreme because I see them sell for about 25 usually. Moving on here. Oh, he's got a Minerick prototype. You know, the Minerick guitar was not bad. I had the, uh, the fire and flames one. This one, I don't really like the body shape of this one. The other one was at least funny, but they are pretty decent guitars for what they are because they have good pickups in them. Being a prototype, that doesn't seem to be too bad of a price. I think I sold mine for around a thousand bucks and it was just a production type thing. You know, it's funny how the late 70s, early 80s Gibson horns are a little bit lazy. I never really notice it until you look at them side by side. So you see this guy, then you see that one. It almost makes you think it looks fake. And there's so many people that question them. Is this fake? Is the cutaway wrong? Eh, it's just how it is. Ooh, that's not a bad price here. 1996 Gibson SG Jr. All right, so this one is... No, this is the SG-1. Similar to the one that we talked about before, <laughs> but not quite the same. It's part of the All-American series. Um, this is actually in the Dark Wine Burst finish. 674 10 plus 50 shipping. That's a really fair price for somebody who wants to buy one of these. There's also something kind of similar called the SGX. I'm not quite 100% sure what all the differences are at this point in time. This one's had some modifications to it. Just had somebody send me a help request. Just in case you don't know, I do offer private help sessions on my website ranging from five to $20. It's honestly underselling my services, but I like answering questions. So here's a few other ones. This one's really beat up at 650. That's, whoa. <laughs> somebody put a Bigsby on this at one point in time. It's been scratched up and played, but you know, if it's been played that much, there's probably a good reason for it. But you just got a single pickup there. Looks like an ABR1 bridge with the tailpiece. I bet these things are pretty okay players, but you can see that's 700 bucks right there. It's been there for a year, probably not gonna sell anytime soon, but even this one just listed at good condition. I don't like the burst job on this one as much. And somebody's replaced the tuners, not a bad thing. And they got a new standard truss rod cover on it. Oh, and they moved. The... <laughs> That's a strange place for a strap button, but it must work. But here you can see these guys usually range from about 500 to 750. So as I was saying, that's a pretty fair price, especially buying it from Norm's Rare Guitars. Les Paul Pro. I think I remember looking at this one before. It was routed for a humbucker in the bridge position at one point in time, but that's a fantastic combination of specs though. So you could easily put that humbucker back in as long as they didn't fill it in. And the other nice thing about the Pro Deluxe, that's why it says Pro on the truss rod cover, is they came stock with P90 pickups. So these are 70s P90s and you get an ebony fretboard. So if you ever find a deluxe that has an ebony fretboard, it usually means it started life as a pro deluxe with P90s. I've had one of these before. Was not a very good guitar. It was super heavy, not really resonant, but it had wear similar to this one, so somebody must have enjoyed it. That's not a terrible price. Maybe talk them down to about 16 and you'd be good. It looks like we got a couple of PRSs in here. Um, let's take a look at the Karina one. I do not follow the PRS market too much. It's not that I don't like the guitars. I actually think the history of them is kind of cool how this company came out of the ashes of Gibson and Fender because when they were at their lowest points, that's when PRS kind of went whoop and kind of forever secured its place in history. There's actually a video series on YouTube about PRS and its history from the man himself, he's telling it, first person story. And that really motivated me to want to buy more PRS guitars. But then, then I kind of got confused about the market and said, eh, we'll just stick with what I know for now. <laughs> There's a Nags seven tier three trem buck. It's interesting. I don't know if I like it or not. What do you guys think? It's like a tiger tore it up. I do not like that headstock. 
Kind of reminds me of that Trini Lopez one we were looking at a few days ago, but not quite as nice. But I hear there's a big following for these things. There's another one of them International Colors guitars, a Telecaster that time. Norm definitely knows how to stock a really cool shop. That's all I gotta say. You might have to pay a premium with this stuff, but I think it's also worth the experience if you're going there to check all this stuff out. And before we say goodbye, how about we answer that guy's question live on the air? So he paid $10 for a model ID session. So he says, hi, love your channel. I recently purchased a left-handed R959 reissue. 2018 model, he's pretty sure it's legit and he got a very good price and also noticed its head shape. Sometimes people look too much into these things. Guitars are not perfect from the custom shop. And sometimes it's just historic details that they don't understand. And I have to educate them and then they go, oh, okay. So it's a defect, but it's supposed to be like that. It's like the thin binding in the cutaway. So he wants me to take a look at this listing. So let's go ahead and see here. So it looks like he paid around six grand. That's a pretty high price. You can get a brand new one about for that, but I don't think they did the left hand ones this year. Maybe it's on custom order only. So I can tell you from right here, it's 100% legit. And if it's not 100% legit, it would probably be like a, uh, a boutique builder that can make it just as good as Gibson. So does it matter at that point? That's a topic for another day. But everything on this one is looking good to me. It even has the tone sticker. You've got your fret nibs. That's something you always want to check. Most counterfeits don't bother to do that. Your serial number is definitely good. I don't see anything wrong with the headstock shape. You've got the COA 804. You just got to make sure it matches. You got all the case candy. It's got the correct case. Nothing about this rubs me the wrong way, but I wish so much that I could have paid $10 for somebody to tell me my snake pit was fake and then I could have saved myself 15 grand. So that's why I offer that service because I tried to get help. I paid for appraisals at places and nobody would help me. They would just say, we declined to comment. But I'll definitely go ahead and grab some additional photos from this guy, just in case they did a bait and switch. They gave you real listing photos, and then they sent you something a little bit different. But I hope you chocolateites enjoyed getting to check these out and the bonus viewer question at the end. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, and we will see you tomorrow on the next episode. Take care.